when I definitely. Think. Um, well, uh, thanks so much for having me. It's always great to to talk about treatments, talk about documentaries, talk about all the different kinds of things that we look for, and I'm always happy to you know give. Uh, not just my own personal perspective, which Christian, as you know, I'm I'm always very easy to do, but also just the type of thing that we're looking for at ITBS. Um, for those of you guys that don't know me, uh, I'm the senior strategist in digital content at ITBS. I'm Kareem Ahmed. Uh, I've been at ITBS for almost 10 years, and I've overseen pretty much all of the funding initiatives that we've done. Uh, here at ITVS, and I'm currently overseeing our newly launched Digital Open Call, which is in its first year, where we're funding, um, we're offering R&D funding for independent filmmakers to pilot web series for public media digital channels. So, this is kind of a new and innovative thing that very few folks, aside from NBPC and ITVS, are doing right now. Um, so, it's a really exciting thing for us to be doing. Um, so. Uh, you know, I'm going to try and speak a little bit more generally about treatments, though, since I know a lot of you guys aren't working on web series, you're working on feature documentaries, or in some cases, uh, even narrative films. And I think uh, the good thing is, I think a lot of these principles, from format to format, or you know, film type or media type to media type, um, apply. Uh, I, I think a lot of these principles are universal, so I'm going to really try and make this presentation as universal as possible. Um, and I'm also going to try and get through the presentation pretty quickly because I find that what's most useful, uh, as Christian and I have talked a lot about, um, one of the things that's most useful is being able to be as specific as possible in response to your questions. So I'll kind of go through the agenda that, uh, that we've set out, but um, I really encourage you guys to, when we get to that point about halfway through this presentation, um, to uh, really, or halfway through the webinar, I should say, uh, to really be very forthcoming with your questions, and I'll be happy to answer them as best as I can. Uh, so, uh, just really quickly to kind of run through our agenda here, um, you know, uh, I want to break down a few different, there's a few different ways that I think it makes sense to really talk about a treatment. One is to really also couch the treatment within the greater context of a proposal overall, because a lot of funders um, or potential buyers may be requesting a treatment, but it's also a piece of a greater proposal. I think it's important to understand how a treatment fits in a greater proposal uh, in context to really understand what its purpose is and what are some of the other elements that you might want to include in a proposal. Um, I'll obviously break down kind of what I look at as the anatomy of a treatment, um, and obviously there's going to be sort of tips embedded within that. Um, for those of you guys that are working on documentaries or documentary or any kind of nonfiction project, uh, I think it's always important to talk about a treatment within the context of the work in progress that you may or may not be submitting uh, to supplement it um, so that we really kind of understand what are the types of things that work well within treatments and how do you want the treatment to relate to a work in progress video um, if you've done some production on your project thus far and how those two things are going to work together. Uh, and then, of course, I'll just talk about some of my own uh, you know, pet peeves or common mistakes that I've seen applicants make over the years uh, that are particularly common, and then, as I mentioned earlier, leaving a lot of time for Q&A as much as possible. So, um, launching right into it, when we're talking about a proposal, we're obviously talking about the treatment, but we're also talking about a few other elements, and the elements that I'm showing here in this slide really kind of detail the particular elements to the way that we request proposals here at ITVS, um, and other funders will look at them similarly, but you know, every funder and every buyer is a little bit different, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, so really make sure that you're structuring your proposal very closely to the specifications of that particular funder. Um, so at ITVS, you know, the different elements that we're looking for in addition to the treatment are the synopsis, and I really can't stress the importance of a synopsis enough. It's particularly important, and it's particularly important to really leave your proposal with that. Um, I always really pay a lot of attention to a synopsis because it really helps ground me in the story before I enter into a treatment. You know, the treatment is really the meat of the proposal, and it's going to take up the most real estate on the page. Um, but I, it's really important that the funder uh, really understands that you understand what your story boils down to in its essence, because there's going to be a lot of moving parts to the treatment, a lot of moving parts to your story, and we really want to be able to understand what is at the core of this, what is the central journey, what are the central themes, you know, what is the experience of this story really all about. So I really encourage you to keep your synopsis very brief, a paragraph or shorter, a log line is fine too. But really try and boil it down to the theme, the central characters, and the story. What is the story in a nutshell? What is it at its core? What's unique? 
what's untold, and what is the thing about it that is most going to get people really, really excited to know more, right? So we're really talking about an elevator pitch here, right? If you only had, you know, 10 to 30 seconds to tell somebody the story, how would you do it in the most compelling way possible? And that's really what your synopsis is. Uh, the treatment, obviously, we'll go through in a little bit, uh, but some of the other elements that I think are important to include are a discussion of style. It's really important to talk about, you know, what is your approach, your aesthetic approach to making of this particular project. Um, again, I think in this case you can really be brief, but be to the point. When we look at style discussions and proposals, I typically recommend that applicants really keep that to a paragraph as well. You know, don't go on at length about the different styles that you want to incorporate or influences or references to other films or things like that. That's really not as necessary as spending as much time to tell the story uh, as best you can. So keep that brief. Again, I think a paragraph is fine. Uh, but it's great to talk about camera choice, shooting style, editing style, sound design, storytelling style. Again, style references in terms of other films are okay, but they're not ideal. Um, it's always better to really just kind of say what your film is, not what it's um, Equally important is really to understand what's your target audience. You know, who are you trying to reach with this story? Uh, who do you feel it will appeal to and why? And be specific. I see a lot of people just kind of go into a proposal and say, this appeals to a general audience. And that may be true, but I think it's important to really understand, you know, who is the real invested target audience of this story? Who does this story serve in its most direct way? Um, particularly for organizations like ITVS and like NBPC that are really about um, serving underrepresented communities and telling untold stories and you know fostering uh, voices that are not seen in mainstream media or even in public media in a big way it's really important to show you know how your story is going to serve that audience um, in this section it's okay to talk about things like marketing and outreach plans but again I really wouldn't put too much emphasis on that it's really just about understanding and communicating to the funder that you understand what your story is who it appeals to who it serves and why and why it's relevant. So again, be concise, keep it to a paragraph. I think that's totally fine. Um, in terms of appropriateness, this kind of relates to the target audience question, uh, and I mentioned this earlier. You know, we ask people to respond to why this story is appropriate for public television or public media in the case of digital projects. And I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, ITVS is a very specific mission within the public media sphere, as obviously. Um, and it's important to understand not just why your story is appropriate for public media, but why it's appropriate in our case for ITBS. We have a very different mission from public media. I mean, our mission is to foster diversity within the public media sphere. Um, so it's really important to understand, you know, why you wouldn't submit, for example, like a proposal for a cooking show to us, because that's not that's not really within our mission, even though it's appropriate for PBS, it's not the type of stuff that ITBS is going to fund. So it's just really important that you do your homework on your buyer uh, and your funder and really understand what is their mission. Um, and then last but not least, you know, really kind of understand uh, or really communicate to the buyer, you know, what's the current status of the project. Uh, it's important to state, you know, what's your access to the different subjects. Um, you know, on the access front, uh, or sorry, on the status front, just being really clear and direct about what have you shot, how much do you have left to get. Uh, are there any critical relationships or materials that you've acquired that are really kind of make or break for the film or for the project? Uh, if you haven't, identify that they're in progress so that we know that you're tracking the necessity of that. Um, but, you know, it's really important, particularly for your main characters, obviously, to, to get access confirmed before you apply. Otherwise, that tends to flag some concerns for the funder. So, uh, some things to just keep in mind in terms of the meat of the proposal itself outside of the treatment. So when we're talking about a treatment, you know, let's break down the elements of it. Um, you know, I really try and dissect a treatment as much as possible, and I really do think kind of structurally about what we want to see in a treatment. And, you know, even though I don't read them like this, I have kind of a checkbox in my mind that I'm kind of instinctually drawn to when I'm reading a treatment. Um, you know, that being said, before I dive into that, I think, you know, when thinking how to approach a treatment, it's, it's really useful to just kind of think about if you were verbally going to tell somebody the story, like if you're at a cocktail party or a dinner party, 
or you're, you know, actually making a formal pitch in a verbal way, you know, how would you tell this story? And really kind of think that through and maybe actually, you know, sit someone down and before you sort of start to dig into how you're going to write the treatment, really actually really go through that exercise of telling the story because, you know, when you're verbally telling a story, you naturally gravitate towards, you know, starting off with something really compelling and universal and essential and in some cases kind of hooky about the story that, you know, telling the story verbally kind of just helps you really drill down in that in a really, in a really quick way. Um, so I would really encourage kind of going through that exercise because if you're just telling the story and you're really just focused on, you know, this is how I would tell this story, you really kind of get yourself into the mindset of like cinematically how the story would be told as well. And that's kind of what you're trying to recreate in the treatment. You're, you're as best as possible trying to map out the story on paper, the film on paper for your reader. Right? So the reader wants the experience of seeing the film as they're reading the treatment. So, you know, think about how you would begin, you know, think about, you know, like your synopsis, you want to lead with what the story is at its core, what is the story about in its purest essence, you know? Um, like, this is the story of a disenfranchised community discovering its power, or this is the story of an individual uh, struggling with his own impending mortality or couple limitations. Right? These are the universal themes that you want to apply to your story. Right? So really try and give us the essence of it. But don't overgeneralize. Be very specific about plot. Um, for example, you know, this is the story of an African-American teenage girl from a struggling family in Flint, Michigan, who became the first ever Olympic boxing champion. Right? That's the story of T-Rex, which is a film that ITVS funded. It's going to be on Independent Lens in our coming season. Um, you know, that's kind of what the story is about in its essence, and that, you know, not only kind of touches on thematically what the story is, but it also kind of alludes to the journey, right? You want to foreground that as much as possible, too, right? So if I wanted to foreground the journey of this particular film, you know, this story follows Clarissa and her journey from the Olympic training to qualifiers to the 2012 Olympics and beyond, as we see the impact this has on her life, her family's life, her financial situation back home in Flint, and that, you know, in some way sheds light on the complicated and true nature of the American dream, right? So it gives you a sense of, like, what is the literal journey that the film is going to encompass, but also what is the thematic journey and what are the, the sort of universal elements of that story that can apply to anyone, uh, you know, whether they can directly relate to the experience of this character or her community or not, right? So you want to try and, you know, be as... Uh, uh, be as direct in terms of the literal journey, but also as universal and thematic in your discussion as possible. And so really kind of foreground that journey. But once you've kind of gone through that, it's also really important to talk about structure. And structure is something that I, you know, tend to lean on a lot because it really helps me just kind of understand what is the scope of this film. Um, so when you're writing your treatment, it's really helpful to kind of think through how do you convey the film in a macro and a micro sense, right? So how do you convey the macro structure of the film, but how do you also give a sense of some of the, the micro elements, like what are some of the specific challenges that this character or set of characters or community will face during this journey, and what do some of the scenes look like? And so that's really kind of the balance that your treatment needs to, to achieve is telling that macro and that micro. So I tend to approach it first from a structural standpoint, you know, as best as you can envision right now, what is the structure of this film? Are you taking a more traditional or conventional three-act structure, which is totally fine because a lot of stories work really, really well in that way? Um, or does this story beg to be told in a different kind of structural paradigm? Uh, is it Does it work better in a nonlinear way? Um, is it more sort of factual uh, and less character driven in a way that might necessitate it takes a little bit of a nonlinear structure where you don't necessarily have central characters but you're dealing with the evolution of an idea which is a much more challenging story to execute um, but when you're doing something like that you want to convey what that structure is and how the different chapters or acts of the film are going to to uh, to communicate that and then ideally you want to structure the treatment such that it reflects that that structure of the film so give me again the experience of the film on paper as best as you can so you want to detail the acts um, if it is character driven you know I tend to 
think that a lot of character-driven docs are surprisingly like narrative feature films. You have a character that starts out in the story out of balance with the world in some way, um, and then you know something kicks them into gear as a protagonist on a journey, right? So tell us, tell us as the funder what that is, um, and then what is this? What is driving the story forward? Is it spine, right? So really foreground that. This is the end of the story. This is what is propelling this character. This is, again, in a narrative feature film sense, this is what their goal is. This is what the story is trying to achieve. And this is how we know when the movie is over, when they've achieved it or not. And if they haven't, they've achieved some other level of balance or not, right? But again, giving us that sense of the entire journey of the story from a structural standpoint. Um, you know, a tip uh, just to embed in this piece of things is that too often I see treatments that really lead with character backstory. And oftentimes, that is not the best way to tell your story. Because if you lead with you know, who this character, uh, where this character comes from, where they were born, where they grew up, what their circumstances were like during childhood, things like that, oftentimes a lot of that is not relevant to the central story of the film. And I find it's much more compelling as a reader to really just ground us, land, you know, hit the ground running, and really ground us into the story. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, with the story in motion, right? So we land into the story when the central journey of the film is beginning. And we really kick the central conflict into gear in a very immediate way. And then you really invest us in the journey of this particular character. You hook us into their central struggle. And then, and only then, maybe like the beginning of your second act, then give us their backstory. Because by then we'll be asking for it. We'll be thinking, wow, that's a really cool story. How did this person get to be like this? And then you'll give us some important or defining information about who they are that really humanizes them that much more. Um, but again, be judicious. You're not writing an autobiography in this case. You're trying to tell a story that has a structure and a journey. Um, so also on structure, one of the things to think about is just kind of how much space on the page to allocate for how much act. Um, a lot of treatments uh, that I see that work well tend to spend uh, proportionally greater time focusing on the first act of the story than the second and third. And um, part of that is just because uh, you really want to ground the reader in the story and make sure they understand the world, understand the gravity of the character's situation and you know what's at stake for them. Um, and then once we understand that, we can kind of resort to a bit of a shorthand for the second and third acts, and that's okay. Um, as long as we kind of understand the journey in a really detailed way, and we understand that you've projected for what the potential outcomes are for this story, right? So even if you're, you're, you're not completed with production yet, do the best you can to predict the different outcomes and what effect that might have on the story and really kind of include that in the treatment. So that's important. Um, when thinking through the way that you're going to render your character, uh, I recommend conveying not only who they are literally, but also who they are emotionally. It's important that we as the reader understand the literal situation that they're in, the plot, the A story, uh, but we also really need to be more deeply engaged with them as emotional human beings because that's what humans will relate to in stories, right? So, for example, a lot of times I recommend, you know, really trying to, uh, as best as possible, state a character's clearly defined values, right? So what do they value above all else, right? Family, that's obviously very sympathetic. Um, money, less so, right? Um, so what will I relate to in this character? You know, even if I'm not from the community that this story takes place in, you know, how will I relate to this character? So it's important to, to kind of help me, help me get there. Um, understanding a character's vulnerability or seeing that, demonstrating that, that's obviously something that's incredibly sympathetic to see uh, because we're all vulnerable in different ways. Um, or maybe I don't need to like them. Right? Maybe they're just so damn interesting and complex that I just want to know what makes them tick, even though I don't like them and you know, they're not the type of person I'd want to hang out with or that I necessarily want to see succeed, but I just kind of want to understand and I kind of want to know what happens next because it's just such a fascinating set of circumstances. Um, so it's important to kind of really try and drill down on that and again, you know, really kind of distill as much as you can because in a lot of cases you're dealing with very limited real estate on the page. Um, plot, you know, kind of talked about this uh, in relation to structure, but be thorough, project as much as you can, uh, conveying the macro and the micro. I don't, as the reader, need to know everything, but I do need to know the broad strokes and some of the finer strokes. I want to be able to have a sense of what are some of the specific hurdles that these characters are going to 
excuse me, that these characters are going to encounter during the journey that they're taking. So that's really important. Um, so I talked a little bit about thematics early on, but I just want to kind of call that out. You know, what is the central theme of this story? Um, again, is it about, you know, disenfranchised communities finding their own power, you know, individuals struggling with their own mortality, whatever it is that's universal about that. Really try and foreground that. Um, similar to what we talked about earlier in terms of the proposal, understanding your target audience is really important. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, really understanding the appropriateness, right? So stuff I kind of talked about in the last slide, but just to reiterate it. Um, okay, so, you know, a couple things to really think about just in terms of when you're writing um, is really make sure that you're writing in a visual way. Um, so don't write it from the perspective of this happened, then this happened, then this happened, but try and write it from the perspective of this is what I'm seeing on screen. You know, it's okay to say we see this or to write in the present tense, you know, uh, we experience this, we're with this character when this happens, but really kind of, again, paint a picture. Try and write as visually as possible. Um, particularly, it's particularly important actually for stories that aren't going to be told in the verite kind of way. So if we're not actually there uh, with the camera witnessing something happening, but if we're witnessing uh, if we're dealing in historical subject matter, how am I experiencing this historical piece? What am I seeing that is helping me tell the story or understand it? Okay, uh, so some of this stuff I've already covered before in terms of tips, but, you know, really just focus on telling the story. Try not to get too bogged down in, you know, why this story needs to be told, um, what the style of it is, reference, things like that. Really just focus on telling the story from beginning to end. Um, you know, again, the macro and the micro, that's kind of what we like to see in a treatment. It's its a map, so it should give me a sense of, you know, how many miles the overall journey is, but also it should give me a sense of, you know, I need to turn left here and turn right here, and this is kind of what I'm going to see there. These are the signposts. Um, I really encourage folks to use it simple and direct language as much as possible. Um, I think a lot of times people overlook the fact that a treatment, is in, a treatment is an intermediary document. A treatment is not a book that's going to be published that's going to have a wide readership. Uh, it's, it's, it's designed to give a picture of what the ultimate product will be, the ultimate work of art, which is the film. Uh, so you know, don't get too bogged down in trying to make the writing really flowery or complex, but really just kind of try and just tell me what I'm seeing, tell me what the themes are, tell me what the characters are going through. Uh, talked about writing visually, um, and also, you know, this is maybe just kind of one of my pet peeves, but I think it's just an important thing to think about in terms of storytelling, is really trying to avoid superlatives. Um, it it kind of irks me when I look at treatments and I see people saying things like, uh, this story is very compelling, or this story is amazing, or this story is fascinating. You know, the, the reader should be able to judge those kinds of things for themselves. So, you know, what you want to do is tell me what happens and really put me in the emotional space of your characters, right? So what are they saying? What are they feeling? Not what are you trying to communicate to me? Um, in terms of how compelling or exciting you you feel that it is, right? You should really try and make sure that the storytelling is doing that and don't rely on that kind of superlative language to tell me that. Um, anyway, which is one of my pet peeves. Maybe it's just me, but I think it's a good kind of storytelling principle in general. The other thing um, that I just kind of encourage folks to think about in terms of experience design, um, and this is true of treatments. I think it's true of screenplays as well. Uh, but really, you know, understanding what is the situation of the person that is reading the document that you're presenting to them. Uh, this is very true of screenplays in that there are certain types of screenplays that read well and that are easy to read and flow well. Uh, and same thing, there are certain types of treatments uh, in terms of the way that the information is laid out on the page that is easier to read or more difficult to read. Um, so in both cases, if you have really, really long blocks of text, uh, in small fonts with wide margins, right? That's obviously, you know, kind of a challenging document to read, and it really, you know, uh, requires a lot of the reader in a really visceral way, particularly when you think about this reader, you know, kind of seated at their, seated at their desk, reading a variety, a long pile of these treatments, one after the other. You want to try and make the reading experience as easy as possible. So, you know, really try and sort of 
break down the document, you know, give us a little white space on the page, break up the sections as much as possible. Um, obviously, you know, don't give us a ton of white space. You obviously have limited real estate on the page and you want to use it to the utmost. But um, again, don't just load the document up with words um, and try and fill it up with as much space as possible. Just because you have a word count or a word limit doesn't mean that you necessarily need to meet that word limit. But if you can find a way to tell your story in you know, three quarters or two thirds of that space, that's great. Um, that's not the most critical thing, but what is critical is to really just kind of you know, make sure the document is easy on the eye. Right, so using you know a normal size font, not trying to stretch your margins out, breaking up the sections so that maybe you know the style section is separate and that's you know got a couple spaces before you get to it. Each of the acts is broken down. You know maybe when you're uh, talking about a bunch of the scenes in Act Two, you're sort of listing them in bullet points as opposed to giving it a big block of text. Right? There's ways to kind of break down the document that make it easier. Uh, on the eyes and easier to read um, that, you know, just kind of make the experience of reading the treatment in a really visceral way uh, that much easier and more fun. So something to think about there. Um, a couple things I just want to kind of put out there in terms of works in progress, you know, I think it's important to think of a, a work in progress video, right? So right now we're talking about, you know, videos uh, that accompany uh, the submission of a treatment, right? So a trailer, a fundraising trailer, a sizzle reel, something like that. Um, you know, I always encourage people to keep in mind that these works in progress are complementary, should be complementary to the treatment and not redundant of the treatment, right? So you don't want your treatment and your work in progress video to demonstrate the exact same things, right? It should be, you should really be thinking about the treatment and the work in progress from the perspective of what works best about each medium, right? So, um, for example, you know, like I said, a treatment is a map of the story, right? So if we're thinking about the story as like a journey, right, the treatment is the map, but the work in progress is maybe like, you know, the photo album, right? Um, you need the treatment to kind of tell you exactly how you're going to get from point A to point B, but the, the written word is not necessarily going to be as emotional or visceral or you know, exciting in, in a really, you know, in a really deep and kind of in your gut kind of way as watching the work in progress video, like just like the photo album, right? It's just going to, it's going to be more evocative. So, you know, really try and give us some of those emotional moments, some of those sympathetic moments with the character, some of those moments of vulnerability that are really going to help us understand the emotional capital that your film deals in, right? So the treatment kind of deals in intellectual capital to a certain degree. Um, I wouldn't distill it down this much because I think a treatment can actually can be quite emotional as well. But I think the majority of your treatment is kind of giving us that intellectual map and the majority of your work in progress video is giving us that kind of visceral emotional kind of um, picture of what the film is. That said, you know, it's also really important to understand that you know, when we like, when I look at a work in progress video, I want to be able to see some of the goods. I want to be able to see, you know, some proof that you've acquired some of the footage that is referenced in the treatment, right? So you want to have a little bit of overlap so I can see, oh yeah, that scene in the treatment that, you know, read really compellingly to me, I see how that scene plays out in the work in progress, or at least a piece of it, and that's super emotional, that's got me really engaged, I'm really excited by that. So, the proof is in the pudding in a lot of cases, so something to, to keep in mind there. Okay. Uh, you know, lastly, just a few common mistakes. Um, I kind of talked about the importance of a synopsis. So if you omit a synopsis, that makes for a less than optimal reading experience because uh, depending on how well the treatment is written, I may not kind of have that nutshell version, that elevator pitch of what the story is. And I think it's really useful to have that to, to again, think through the reader experience, right? You, you get the treatment, you have a very sort of elevator pitch for what it is, it excites you, it's interesting, okay, I want to know more, and now I can start to dig into the details, but at every point that I'm digging into the details, I have that bigger picture kind of in my mind, and, and it's helping me inform in my mind kind of what the story is uh, as I'm reading the, the finer points that are in the treatment. So I think that's really important. Um, equally common mistake is just making your synopsis too long, right? If you have a synopsis that's a full page long, it's, you know, like half to a third the length of your treatment, in which case 
you're kind of doing double duty and overlapping anyway. So, you know, really keep that treat that, that synopsis short before you go into the treatment, which should really be the main body of the document. Um, another common mistake, you know, is just assuming the reader's level of familiarity. Um, Funders and readers of these types of proposals are generally knowledgeable, knowledgeable folks, but you know you are the authority on your subject matter, not us. So give us all the relevant information. If you're not sure um, what that is, it's useful to get an uninformed reader, a friend of yours, a colleague, to review your treatment for just generally confusing sections of it before submitting. Um, so that's a useful thing to do. Um, also, you're not writing a research paper, right? Obviously, this is an intermediary document that is representative of a film, right? So, you know, think about it visually. Think how the story is going to be told. Think about conveying the words, you know, as I, as the reader, will see it on screen. Um, you know, uh, these last two aren't may seem kind of straightforward, but I think it's important to be with this. Um, uh, you know, I, I just encourage everyone to be as professional as possible in terms of their language choice. Um, sometimes that just means being, you know, avoiding being overly familiar uh, or, you know, using a lot of slang and certainly, you know, using foul language. Uh, you know, it, it's important to, as much as this may seem totally obvious, sometimes people make this mistake. Um, but it's important to really, you know, treat a, a treatment, particularly if it's a if it's a grant proposal, like it's a job interview, because in a lot of ways it is, right? You're asking for a lot of money, and whoever the person is that's reading it wants to, you know, demonstrate that whatever that funding amount is, it's going to be dispersed to someone who is professional and responsible and all of that. So, uh, you know, it's just important to to do that. I mean, you want to convey an artistic voice, and you want to convey you know, the voice of a, an artistic creator, but at the same time, you know, so you don't want it to be like a sterile kind of, you know, again, academic kind of voice, but at the same time, you want to make sure that it's professional. And then definitely make sure you spell check stuff. You know, a couple of typos here and there is not a big deal, but again, you know, kind of stemming off of that professionalism thing, you know, just, it's important just to make sure everything's spell checked. So, I think that's it. Uh, I tried to get through that as soon as I could, as quickly as I could, just because I want to leave as much time for questions as possible. Um, but uh, thanks for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. Um, so I'll switch over to questions, if anybody has it. Thank you, Kareem. That was super, super informative. Um... So yeah, like Kareem said, we can, we can go ahead now and for the rest of the session until uh, about 8 p.m. Eastern or so, we can uh, take some questions from folks, and there, also there will be a recording of this available on the NDPC website uh, by Monday, uh, and we will also provide Kareem slides just so people can go back and reference and uh, refresh their memory as well. Yeah, so we'll, we'll make the deck available as well. Uh, Kareem, you you had you made a good point about um, all the specific stuff of the presentation. But sometimes, sometimes we also get some uh, questions about length. Just in terms of everything, uh, like synopsis, treatment. Because uh, I I'll receive these novel like proposals sometimes, and it's just. It's not, it doesn't help me understand the project more. It actually makes me disinterested in even starting to read it. What is your best experience in terms of the, the length of uh, a proposal, a synopsis, treatment, everything included? Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you, Christian. I think, you know, um, it's... Uh, it's it's challenging when you get a really long proposal, and you know, particularly when you get a really long proposal, you know, someone put a lot of time and effort into it, and you want to read the whole thing. But a lot of times, you know, there is a lot of unnecessary information in there, mm -hmm. and I think that right. it's important to again remember that a treatment is an intermediary thing. You know, it's not designed to give us every single moment of the film and every single important detail. It's intended to really. Um, you know, just convey, uh, you know, what is the overall journey and give us kind of definitely all of the macro and a little bit of the micro. And so, you know, when I'm, I'm you know, when I, let's see, to go back in this doc here. So, like, if we're looking at the anatomy of a proposal, like, a lot of this stuff on this slide right here, you know, should be no more than a paragraph, right? right. And a short paragraph. 
You right. know, like that's what that's what I like to see. You know, maybe like you know four to six lines maximum. Right. Um, you know, but you know, uh, shorter is shorter is good. You know, mm-hmm. um, when I'm thinking about a treatment, you know, I, I really encourage you to tailor it. I really encourage everyone to tailor it to that particular funder. And some of them definitely require shorter than others. You know, our proposals need to be under seven pages. Um, you know, but I, I often think that you know you really don't need that much space. I mean, we used to we used to have the proposal length limit be three pages, um, and that was challenging. I mean, I feel like kind of the sweet spot, particularly for the different elements that we're asking for, the sweet spot is kind of between three and five. Um, I think if you can get your treatment and the actual treatment piece of it, not these other you know elements that you see on this anatomy of a proposal slide, if you can get you know, the treatment to like two to three pages, I feel like that's a really good length to really detail the broad strokes and some of the finer strokes of the story. And then, you know, a page, page and a half for all of these other sections is really a good target. So I like to read proposals that are kind of five pages or under. Right. Um, so, you know, but we, we at ITVS do, for some of our initiatives, like the open call, take proposals that are seven pages or less. For the digital open call, for R&D proposals, I think it's really okay, like for our diversity development fund as well, I think it's totally okay to have a three-page proposal like soup to nuts, like all in three pages, because, you know, you're projecting what a film is going to be, and it's still in development, right? You haven't even begun production yet, so it's okay for things to be kind of early stages. Well, uh, you know what, I don't know if I'm doing a show. That's a, that's a good point. Um, I don't know if you're doing the show either. If you are, <laughs> is that someone? Is that someone's microphone on? If you don't mind muting yourself, uh, we have a question here from Riyadh that says, um, if the synopsis and treatment are used in a conjunction with a pitching event, uh, they want to know if you have any recommendations for how the pitch should complement the synopsis and treatment, uh, because that really does sound like a third element, not. Um, not the same as a synopsis because it seems like it has to be even shorter, um, even more Hollywood, more fancy, like quicker somehow. So I guess the question is, how does a pitch complement um, a synopsis and treatment? Yeah, I think you know that's a really good question. Um, we don't deal in pitches very often at ITVS just because we don't we don't typically. We don't ever really make our decisions based solely off a of pitch. Uh, people will pitch us, and then you know they'll follow it up with written materials, and the written materials are the basis for our decision-making process. Right. But um, that obviously, you know, a lot of other funders or markets work in a different way, and they actually do make decisions based off a of pitch. I will say, which, uh, just in terms of you know our experience at MBPC with pitches, um, because you were just Kareem was just on our panel for MBPC 360. Uh, and a pitch is, you're right, completely different from what Kareem is talking about in the synopsis or in the treatment. When Kareem says that the synopsis has to be an elevator pitch, it really has more meat, almost, in a sense, um, than a pitch does. Because a pitch is something that you can give to an audience either in front of a large crowd or like two seconds at a dinner party because you happen to meet the Ford Foundation president. Um, so it has to be that flexible. Um, so it's it's something that you can take from your synopsis, obviously, because like Kareem says, uh, that's the most important part of your story, the part that's the hook of your story. Uh, but it also is not not at all your treatment, because your treatment is like playing the movie for people in their heads. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's important to think through kind of what do you mean when you're asking about a pitch, and I'm, you know, there, there is that elevator pitch or that cocktail party pitch, but then there's also that, like, performed pitch for an audience, like we did at Pitch Black, you know, and that, I feel like, you know, that that serves almost a third purpose that is kind of similar to a work in progress, which is like, you know, you are literally kind of, well, not literally, but you're, you're, you're kind of performing the the film in a, in a way, you know, like you're you're giving us that kind of map of the story and that feeling of like from moment to moment and act to act, what does the story consist of? But you're also like really trying to channel the emotions of your characters in a certain way in the way that you're telling the story. So it is, you know, there is that layer of performance to it that kind of makes it a little bit of like 
a hybrid in between both. You know, right. it's like a little bit of a work in progress and a little bit of a treatment. You know, it feels when I've when I've done pitches, when I've listened to pitches, I think it's totally fine for the pitch in terms of the words used to borrow a lot of the language from the treatment. Um, and it's always, you know, it's, it's good to do that as well because in those circumstances when you have a treatment, a pitch, and a work in progress, you never necessarily know, depending on who your funder is or who you're pitching to, how deeply they kind of dug into the written material. Right. So while you have them as, you know, a sort of a captive audience during that pitch, you, you know, you want to make sure that if there are any really critical story elements to, that were referenced in the treatment, don't necessarily assume that they got all those details and really make sure that you kind of emphasize what's really important and really try and channel that kind of performative aspect of what the, the central characters in the story are going through as you're doing it. So it is an interesting kind of hybrid, but I feel like it's okay to reiterate some of that stuff from your treatment as long as you're, you know, you're not doing it necessarily word for word. And Karim, you're right about the performative aspect, because a lot of people underestimate that. So you don't have to take an acting class, but record yourself doing it or say it to someone or a group of people so that you have a, a more real sense uh, of what it actually is, is reading like. Um, we have another question here uh, from Shayok, uh, and she says, it's a target audience question for a film like No Le Diga Sanadi Tell No One. What would you say is the target audience? I, I haven't seen that film, so I, I, I haven't either, so I, I can't, can't really answer that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but target audience, I I would say or comment it is it is very dependent on who the filmmaker wants to reach. So even despite what the content of the film is, if you decide that you're only going to focus on giving this film to 12 year olds in Nicaragua, that's your target audience. So the decision is completely up to you. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's interesting to think through, like, you know, who benefits from this story being told, and like, you know, who who has utility for this film, right? So, like, how do you, you know, who who could use the film in a way that you know benefits from having their story told, or who is invested in the story of that film being told? Um, so I think that's kind of the way to think about it. Or, or, who, or to look at it another way, who needs to hear this story, right? Who right. doesn't understand this community or this story and who, who you know, is benef who, who is conducting themselves in a way that could be altered, that, that where an ignorance could be altered or corrected by hearing this story, right? So in some cases, the target audience is not necessarily, you know, the converted, but it's like who else do you, you know, who else do you need to preach to besides the folks that are converted? Right. Uh, there's another question here from Carla, and she says, can you suggest resources for assistance for treatments? Is hiring a consultant worth it? Um, you know, my, my personal feeling is that it's not worth it to hire a consultant unless, I mean, unless they're really, really <laughs> good and have a demonstrated, you know, uh, a demonstrated track record of just, you know, kind of always getting funding. But I feel like, you know, um, making a film and writing a treatment are very different skills, but, uh, and I know there's a lot of those kinds of consultants out there, you know, that's not to say that working with someone like that um, couldn't potentially be useful for making the treatment better, but I feel like there are so many better ways for filmmakers to spend their precious money in terms of actually getting the film made and working on the film that, you know, in a lot of cases hiring, you know, spending hard-earned money on hiring consultants is probably not the most effective. Right. So, right. That's my own personal opinion. <laughs> that's not so, necessarily, that's you know, company point. policy or anything like that, but my personal opinion is like, if you've got limited resources, you know, don't hire a consultant to help you rewrite a treatment or a proposal, you know, just get get some of your friends to read it, other filmmakers, you know, mentors, folks like that that have kind of, you know, helped you through your career, uh, get their advice because those are people that are invested in your success in general and have some more experience with it uh, and save your precious money for, for getting the film made because God knows the funding is scarce these days. Okay, fair point. Uh, and then I think this will be our last question, uh, and it's from Ralph, and he wants to know, 
Um, well, we might have one more after that. Uh, he wants to know in, in your comment earlier about not bogging down your treatment with backstory, um, how that works in the context of telling or writing a treatment that is sort of like a cradle to grave story about somebody, because um, yeah, it seems hard to avoid that. Right. Right. So um, it's interesting. So, uh, you know, so strangely enough, um, I, I was just watching uh, part of The Theory of Everything last night, uh, the film about Stephen Hawking. And, you know, that that isn't a cradle to grave story of his life. And obviously that's a that's a fictional uh, rendering of his life based on his wife's memoir. Um, so it's not exactly kind of what you're talking about. But um, I think it's, you know, that, that type of story really does... It, it, I think what they did well was they really kind of focused on the relationship between the two of them, uh, him and his, his first wife, as the lens into Hawking's story. And I, I bring that up not only just because I happened to, to watch part of it last night, um, and so it reminded me of, you know, the, the, when I saw the whole thing, the kind of lens that they applied to it, but also anytime you're telling someone's story, you know, you're telling it for a reason, and there are certain critical aspects of their life and certain critical elements of the journey of their story that I think are the reason that you're telling it, right? So right. you're not necessarily telling their story because of their childhood, unless you are, and that's okay, and then that's a critical element of the story, but you know, I'm guessing that it's something that they accomplished during adulthood and something... Right, as you say, a key event and jumping off point and to kind of take it from there, right? So what kind of kicked their story into gear, you know, and what is really the central crux of their story? What are the central conflicts that they encountered? What is the central theme of their journey and their life story? Kind of get us into that as quickly as possible. And then by all means, late in the first act, early in the second act, or later in the film, if you think that's more artistic than relevant, give us their from their childhood or wherever else in their life story, but find the entry point in that makes the most sense in terms of its direct relevance to the thematic journey of the film. That's kind of what I would recommend there. Because um, I think, that, again, that just kind of gets us right into the story as quickly as possible. Makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. Thank you. Uh, and I think this will be the last question. Uh, Malkia wants to know, um, in terms of including the producer's information in a proposal, um, I think the general question is, where does that fit in? Um, just in terms of giving your proposal a sense of what you can, what the team can do. Um, and I think... You know, just to comment briefly, at least for MBPC, we do try to keep that information a little separate from your story information because we, we care about what the personnel can do, uh, but we also need a very succinct understanding of your understanding of what the story is. Um, so I, I, would, I, would, I would focus on making both, uh, making both information is available, focusing okay. very much on your story. Sorry about that, guys. I'm not really sure whose mic is on for that. Uh, Christian, I totally agree with you. And when we look at proposals at ITV, similar, which is we have the treatments or proposal section, and then there's a separate section that is either a resume or bio. Um, and so, you know, obviously, like a proposal, you want to be cognizant of what the you know, page limits and restrictions are given the, the nature of the funder, but um, that's typically a separate section and definitely isn't considered part of the proposal. Um, and we, I do encourage you to keep that separate because, you know, much like Christian was saying in terms of MVPC's approach, I totally approach it in a similar way, which is like I really want to focus in on the story, and then once I have the full experience of the story from the treatment and work in progress, then I'll go over and look at the bio and the resume and kind of get to understand or get to know the, the filmmaker a little bit better. Cool. Uh, yeah, so thanks, everyone. Um, thanks again for attending this session. Uh, we have a couple more sessions. Uh, we have one more tomorrow, actually, for, the, for, for this month. Uh, it will be with Ron Simons uh, of Simon Says Entertainment, and he'll be talking to you about not just writing a treatment for documentaries, but writing uh, treatments for series. Uh, and that will be at the same time here, uh, tomorrow. You can get that link from our website at blackpublicmedia.org. Uh, a recording, as, like I said, of Kareem's session will be available Monday. Thank you very much, Kareem. We appreciate you 
taking the time. Um, and we will see you again at some point when we uh, make you do one of these again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. I love talking story with folks. So thanks for having me. And if anybody has any follow-up questions or anything like that, uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can see my uh, my Twitter handle on the screen right now. So feel free to tweet me up, and I'll do my best to offer any additional advice if you guys have any. Great. Tweet it up, guys, uh, and have a good evening. If you're going to go ahead and watch that horrible debate, uh, you can freely go and do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Take it easy. Bye, guys.